Welcome to our evening worship service. Thank you for joining us. As we begin, I'm going to invite you to stand to receive the greeting from God. Grace and mercy and peace be yours from God the Father and from Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Our call to worship is going to come from the book of Philippians, the section of scripture just before what Dean is going to preach on this evening. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Let us glory and praise God now by singing, Guide me, O my great Redeemer. Guide me, O my great Redeemer, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but you are mighty. Hold me with your powerful hand. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me now and evermore. crystal fountain where the healing waters flow. Let the fire and cloudy pillar lead me all my journey through. Strong deliverer, strong deliverer, ever be my strength and shield. Ever be my strength and shield. When I tread the verge of Jordan, bid my ancient sin subside. Death of death and hell's destruction, lend me safe on Canaan's side. Songs of praises, songs of praises, I will ever sing to you. I will ever sing to you. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we are worshiping again in distanced fashion, I pray that you would enable us to be grateful people in times that don't lend themselves to gratitude. Right now, I pray that we would be grateful for the technology that enables us to still worship despite the fact that we are separated. We thank you that <clears throat> just a couple years ago when we renovated the church, one of the capacities that was added was the capacity to live stream. And so that in your gracious timing, this virus has come at a time when we have been able to continue holding services in dis distance fashion with no great disruption to our church life. We thank you for these technological means which, while they don't substitute for the privilege of being gathered together to sing your praises, still enable us to engage and to hear from you and to worship you while we are separate and distanced. Lord, we thank you that in the midst of global pandemic that you do not change. As we've been going through Malachi in the morning and have heard that you don't change, therefore we are not consumed, we pray that we would live out the reality of that knowing that your changelessness assures the fact that you will always love us, that you will never leave us, that you will always be holy and righteous and good. We thank you that we have complete assurance that you will never turn your back on us because you are not a fickle, changing deity, but you are the changeless God of the universe. We thank you that in the midst of global pandemic, that so many people are still answering the call to work in essential services and businesses, to serve on the front lines combating the virus. We thank you for so many people who have risen to the challenge and continued to be gracious 
have reached out with love to fellow members of the congregation, to family, to friends. And we thank you that your word is true now. No less true than when all is right and good and seemingly peaceable in the world. We thank you that your word stands true at this very moment. We thank you for Dean's willingness to bring this message. And we pray that as he tells us about what it is that your word says, that we would listen and that we would hear the glory of your word, which is truth. We pray all of this in the powerful name of our Redeemer, thanking you that the blood will never lose its power, not even in times of separation and sickness. And we pray this in the power of the Holy Spirit, who continues to be with us. Amen. Let's worship God again, and let's sing the song, Abide With Me. God's word together. I want to invite you to behold the wonders that the gospel has for us as we look at Philippians chapter 1 verses 12 through 26. I'll give you a moment to turn there with me, but the words will also be on the screen. You know, last time we looked at the first 11 verses of chapter 1, and we saw that Paul had great affection for the Philippian church. He loved them dearly, and he prayed for them often, and his prayers were filled with joy And they were filled with such joy because the Philippians were partners with him in the gospel. They were brothers and sisters in Christ, and because he had great joy in them. Now let's look at verses 12 through 26 together. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard, and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, I will, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. 
For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and to be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these words penned by Paul, yet inspired by the Holy Spirit. These words are the words of life. These are the words of truth. These words have power. Lord, as we look and seek to understand the scripture tonight, we ask that you make good on your promise to draw near to us as we draw near to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This section in Philippians is broken up into two main parts. The first part, verses 12 through 18, is about how the gospel has been progressing. And the second part, verses 19 to 26, is how the gospel is going to continue moving forward. So the first section is about the present, and the second is about the future. Before we take a look at these sections of scripture, I want to ask you the question, what is the gospel? If someone asked you to explain the gospel, how would you describe it? So I think it might be helpful here to give you my definition of what the gospel is. The gospel is the good news that we do not get what we deserve. We are sinners who deserve death, but through Jesus we have life. God had compassion on us and sent his son to suffer and die in our place. An innocent man who took on our sins, and through his sacrifice we are now made right with God. And when we accept Jesus we receive this gift of salvation. So now, God no longer sees us in the horror of our sins when he looks at us, but he sees the righteousness of Christ. And because Jesus defeated death, we have confidence that one day we will be in the presence of the Lord with him forever and ever. This is the gospel. This is the river that Paul's joy flows from, the gospel, the good news, the future hope, that we cling so tightly to. What we deserve is death and separation from God, but what we get is life, and we have confidence. And now with this gospel in mind, let's take a look at the text. Paul is excited to tell the church what's happened to him, what has happened as a result of his imprisonment. Of his imprisonment. This letter, like many that Paul wrote, is written from prison, and in it, he begins by almost saying, I am excited to tell you what God is doing in this dire situation. Paul's imprisonment has actually become the occasion for the gospel to go out in ways like it never had before, which is probably a surprise to a great deal of people because Paul was put into prison for preaching the gospel. One of the ways that it went out is that he had the occasion to preach to the whole imperial guard. They knew why Paul was there, and they knew he was there for the gospel, and they heard that message. And the imperial guard at this time was no small number. We have record that it would have consisted of about 10,000 men. So 10,000 men would have been made aware of the gospel message through Paul's imprisonment. And that's amazing, but if that's not amazing enough, Paul's imprisonment had actually motivated others to preach the gospel as well. Verse 14 tells us that most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. This seems like the opposite reaction of what we might expect, right? We would expect Christians to be more careful and more private. We would expect them to be afraid and timid, not bold and fearless and confident. You know, how might we react to something like this? Let's say one day Derek is up here preaching Sunday morning and the police come in and arrest him and take him away and we're all watching him on camera. And we know that this happened because he is talking about Jesus too much. He's preaching the gospel too much. How many of us would respond by saying, you know what, I'm going to be even more bold with my faith. 
I'm going to be even more fearless. I am going to be even more confident because of what happened to Derek. Now, we wouldn't expect a reaction like this, but if some of us did respond this way, it would be evidence that, like Paul, our joy is not in our circumstances, but it's in Jesus. And this is why Paul can say what he does in verse 18, and I will rejoice, because to him, his imprisonment is worth it. His suffering is worth it. His pain is worth it. Only that the gospel is preached. Only that the name of Jesus is heard by every ear. Only that others may have salvation and eternal life by the Son of God. Even if people are preaching the gospel in self, out of selfish motives, Paul has resolved in his heart to still rejoice. He knows that people will not have pure motives. Some of them will want to advance their ministry. Some of them will want to make themselves look good and make Paul look bad. But in all of it, as long as the gospel is being preached, Paul could care less about their motives. Actually, Paul says that he is glad, he rejoices that the name of Jesus is being made known. But I want to clarify something here. In these verses 15 through 18, Paul mentions others having selfish motives for preaching the gospel. It is the true gospel, but it's being preached for the wrong reasons. Paul's not talking about something such as the prosperity gospel. You know this gospel? It tells us that if you come to Jesus, he'll give you what you want, also known as the health and wealth gospel. And unfortunately, many people preach this false gospel. Paul would not rejoice in the prosperity gospel because it's not the true gospel. It is a strategy to manipulate Jesus to give you what you want. And that just doesn't work because God does not operate that way. And there's no reason to re rejoice in a false gospel like this, even if the name of Jesus is mentioned. Now I want to take a look at the second part of the text, which is about the future of the gospel. So Paul is rejoicing with confidence that things will turn out for his good. Not that there's the possibility that he'll be released from prison, which he would be happy about, but his confidence and joy is bound, isn't bound up in his current trial. He is confident that things will work out well for his soul. And he has confidence in his salvation through Jesus, through the help of the Spirit, and through the prayers of the Philippians. The prayers of the Philippians reassure him. What a sweet thought to know that people are petitioning God in prayer for you. You know, not too long ago I went through a difficult season and I found myself asking many, many people for prayer. And although things didn't change right away, they eventually did. And it was clear to me that it was through those prayers, through the prayers of my friends, that God was lifting my spirit. He was hearing me. He was answering me. And, you know, I'm sure that many of you could testify to this very same thing. I mean, what a joy it is to pray for others and how sweet it is to know that our prayers do something. So here we get to the title of the message tonight, verse 21. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. To live is Christ, to die is gain. Jesus is the one who completely redefines the meaning of life. And to live without Jesus is to have no life at all. Life is only found in Jesus. A favorite verse of mine that I think really captures the essence of this statement, to live in, is Christ and to die is gain, is from Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, which says, I have been crucified with Christ, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. You see, as Christians, our lives are bound up with Christ, just as Paul does, just as Paul's life was. The life that we live coming to Jesus is no longer our own. It has been crucified, it has died, and we now have a new identity, a new purpose a new life. And that life is defined by God's relationship to us. You know, our lives are no longer measured by our jobs or our careers or our bank accounts or our new cars or our new houses or our 
chronic illnesses or our sufferings of any kind, those things might describe us, but they do, do, they do not define us. And praise God that they don't. I mean, isn't that a great thing? Isn't that great news that we're connected to a holy, eternal, and good God that never changes? Someone who remains the same and keeps his promises? It's no wonder that Paul would want to go and be with the Lord. And he says, in, he says that in verse 23, My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. And don't we all share that same longing? You know, C.S. Lewis uh, puts it this way. He says, If we find in ourselves a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. We long for something greater than that, that this world, don't we? We know that this can't be the best that it can get. There's something better. And that longing inside of us is meant to point us to Jesus. It's meant to point us towards a future hope with him in eternity. But for now, we remain as Paul did. We're here on earth to live out our lives to the glory of God. And Paul concludes this as well for his life. He knows that in his heart he would rather die and go to be with the Lord, but he understands that he still has work to do. He must remain for the sake of the church, to continue to spread the gospel, to continue to exalt the name of Jesus. So Christian, do you care that the gospel is going out and reaching the nations? Are you partnering with Jesus with Paul and with the many saints that have gone before and now go out to proclaim the truth about God? When you hear the gospel, do you think, when you think about the gospel, do you have joy, awe, and wonder? It should convince us that we need to tell others about the hope that we have in Jesus. Anyone listening tonight who doesn't know Jesus, anyone who does not accept him as their Lord and Savior, I want you to consider this. Do you want joy? Do you want real, authentic joy? A joy that's not determined by your finances or relationships or circumstances? Because that joy exists, it really does exist. And it's found in Jesus. And I hope that as we looked at scripture tonight that you saw that. You were meant for more than things of this world. So ask God to open your eyes to the truth of his son, Jesus, and invite him into your heart tonight. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you never give up on us, that you saw our helplessness and you sent help. You sent Jesus to make a way for us to get to you. Thank you for your steadfast love that never wavers or fades. Ignite in us a passion for the gospel that leads us to tell others about you. Lord, please bless us and keep us. Let your face shine upon us. Father, turn your face towards us and give us joy and peace in the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. Now let us join in singing the doxology together. God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son,